Reference mode or the normal? Hmm? Reference mode or normal? Normal. 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 I'll just click. Yeah. Everybody's still here? Okay. <laughs> oh, my, my time started. So I'm um, over ambitious. I want, to s I want to talk about three different engagements I have, uh, I have been involved. Um, let's see if I can manage that. Um, this is the first one, which um, I consider for a long time as a failure, but maybe it's not, we will see. But it was the uh, school I initiated in, in Turkey um, in 2014 uh, uh, until uh, 2015, so it lasted uh, a bit longer than a year, and it's called School of Urgency. So uh, School of Urgency is something that started much later than uh, Silent University. If I have time, I will talk about also <coughs> mainly about that. But everything I learned from uh, Silent University, uh, from my other teaching experiences, from uh, leading a tutorial at DAI or uh, being uh, involved with um, Open School is a little bit, and all this research about alternative models of education and today's uh, uh, very brilliant examples. We are talking about, I thought, okay, first maybe we can, maybe it was the time to establish that utopian model. Um, and I, I knew what I needed, what kind of tools, so a space with all the basic needs that comes from the hosting space and, uh, and the zero budget uh, initiative. And everybody involved, they are not students, so as uh, Sam also explained yesterday, we didn't call them students, they immediately became co-organizers. And it went so fast, way too fast. So these things also with Silent University, it went too fast, I always try to slow it down. Because uh, too fast can mean also to die too fast, which happened in, at the School of Urgency. We went uh, too famous, too fast, too big, uh, very quickly. And uh, they couldn't handle that power we immediately, collectively we established in such a short time. So I was supposed to be there for a while and uh, slowly fade out and uh, they would then uh, establish and get, invite the next group and the next group would take it over and that was the plan I had in mind that, uh, to create uh, sustainability. But I secured the space uh, for a very long time using my own connections. Uh, but after six months they complained my <laughs> with my involvement uh, and they talk about the hierarchy. Like how can we 100% get rid of hierarchy if I am the first one who initiated um, even had a, cl a clear idea how to, how to get involved with others. So at the end, uh, after six months, uh, I had to fire myself <laughs> earlier than I, I planned. And uh, I told them this is too early, but I, I, I was going to fire myself. I, I did uh, already. And they were able to continue six more months themselves. So we, we had such a strong um, establishment with all these uh, principles. We wrote together, we were giving interviews together, everything was done together. So I was thinking there's no hierarchy, but there was still the feeling of hierarchy because of my involvement in it. And I, I left uh, and I would return as a guest. Uh, but it didn't last after the first group. They all got into uh, good programs and I wrote them reference letters and everything. Uh, it, it ended before uh, new ones can get organized as the first group. So uh, it turned into a kind of club uh, with uh, a lot of brilliant people but they were unable to uh, take decisions collectively and continue collectively. Such a failure, I mean, it was such an amazing uh, uh, atmosphere and uh, everyone was ready to give, come give lectures. We had a lot of people uh, back then coming to Istanbul, so I wanted to use existing potential and uh, so many important meetings in such a short time, but it, it died uh, very quickly. Um, next time I will think carefully about the uh, question of hierarchy in that case. Mm -hmm. So it's not only about creating alternative models also. Um, since I'm also uh, every now and then teaching in existing uh, institutions, I think the transformation of academies and institutions are very important. I was thinking uh, academies are easier, easier to transform compared to the museums, like big ones. Uh, uh, like Tate or Pompidou, but uh, from my experience, I see academics are actually more conservative. Uh, I mean, both are very difficult anyway to transform, but uh, it's, ver it's, it's even harder to uh, get involved all these alternative models, radical pedagogic ideas between the existing academies. Did I do five minutes now? Uh, 
Yes. Good. It's the second one. Uh, so <laughs> the day after that is the uh, it's, it's something not forming a model, but actually uh, the issue Sam explained yesterday in U.S. It's this unbelievable issue of uh, over like last ten years. Uh, the student debt is the biggest, debt, largest debt in the US, which is slowly coming towards Europe. Uh, and the second uh, largest uh, place that issues big is UK. So this uh, initiative was uh, in collaboration with uh, Strike Debt, the collective uh, uh, activist organization that was formed by act, uh, academics, lawyers, artists, and many others after Occupy. Uh, they formed an agency uh, that is normally operating in the US that's called, uh, they started a project called, uh, this was an agency, registered agency called Rolling Jubilee. And Rolling Jubilee was buying debts from the banks so that collects actually normally from every individual uh, who loans <coughs> money from those banks to study. And uh, each, every individual, they have, as Sam yesterday gave us the numbers, uh, most of them they have up to $250,000 just because studying not only art but anything uh, these days in the US. So Rolling Jubilee would buy these loans uh, from the banks because they have in between uh, agencies in the US they go and collect from the people, not banks themselves. And they buy it very cheap and they collect over the years. So uh, 30000 becomes 100000 100000 becomes 200000 and so on over the years like 10 years, 20 years period. Uh, so these guys go by very cheap, and they fundraise, and they abolish those debts. So, so far, I think they abolish uh, 30 million, over 30 million dollars debt of people, and they send them a letter, they say you don't own anything anymore. Uh, but it is uh, 1.2 billion uh, dollars we're talking about, and they could manage the entire amount, but that's not what they want to do, they are doing now another project called Debt Collective, like collective refusal of uh, debt. Uh, so they do case studies and uh, from certain colleges and schools, uh, students collectively refuse to pay back their debt and they provide legal advice. So what we did uh, through, um, I, I ask uh, other artists, uh, invite other artists to make sculptures, uh, to make uh, coin-operated machines uh, and sculptures, and, uh, sometimes basic donation boxes, this is Martha Rosler's. And uh, you can see my uh, Space Oddity monolith over there uh, and Natasha Sutter's uh, shared money donation tower and Dan Pajowski's uh, friendship uh, donation bag. Um, to fundraise for uh, Strike Debt Debt Collective Rolling Jubilee uh, that they can use the money for their own uh, counter-financial strategies. So they, or they are already creative. What we do, we, uh, we invite more and more artists to engage and make sculptures to fundraise, but also when the sculptures are sold through an uh, agreement that we prepared with a couple of law lawyers, uh, those sculptures also, the money comes from the sculpt sculpture sales in the market, will go to the same organization uh, over and over again. So it's an inf infinite way of fundraising for uh, the organization. Then I did a second version after an invitation from An Anna Colin. Uh, who is not here present, but who is also one of the organizers of Open School East uh, for British Art Show and to do the UK version. So we invited three more artists. So it's kind of an open source agreement. Any artist can take it and they can make the sculpture and sell it for the same purpose. Uh, but when we have the budget and the occasion, we invite more artists and uh, mostly uh, well established artists. Uh, so they already have a good market value as well. The moment the sculptures are sold, they already have good values. So uh, this is uh, Goshka's Depp Weaver, uh, Liam's uh, donation box, and Susan Healer's um, jukebox. They produce uh, for a day after that, and it's, it's part of the it's part of the touring exhibition for two years. So we have many occasions, civic spaces, not only galleries. So people can actually engage with these works, not only as sculptures, but as uh, really literally uh, as they are. And, uh, and my, my monolith had to travel to Europe, so it's collecting money for extracted in Europe. It was in Vienna, now in, uh, in Hannover. Okay, five minutes, was it good? This is not five minutes, this last one. <laughs> but let's see, I will try. Uh, so I, I didn't just want to talk about silent universe, I want to talk about silent universe in relation to 
like everything I learned from Silent University, to the few other things I, I have done. I wish there was time and, and be a little bit as funny as you and talk about intern VIP lunch I did in, in Pompidou, but maybe another time in another gathering. So Silent University uh, was established uh, with yesterday's question about like institutions like Tate, if they take over, or if you, you also address that, or if you actually, uh, in a parasitic way, uh, collaborate with large institutions. I think that's the hardest experience, but that's really fun. Um, so what, what happened with Silent University it was, uh, in the beginning, I was invited for a residency. The idea wasn't there yet, and invited by Tate Modern and uh, Delfina Foundation uh, for a year-long residency, and, uh, and then I come up with this idea. But the moment I proposed the idea, I said this is not only until December 2012. I have to be committed to it a lifetime, and it's same for you, for the institution because we had one year contract. So after that one year contract, they had to re-engage, not with a project that was initiated by them, but with a, another organization. So Silent University within a year became a small scale organization. They had to have a conversation with as another organization as potential collaborator, not the owner, not just uh, keep it, and they wanted to keep it actually, um, without uh, investing in it, um, and it wasn't such a big investment in the first year anyway, but uh, even without that, they just wanted to keep hosting it without any investment. And that was absolutely the, the one of the first important steps. How a parasitic organization like Silent University maybe not yet have its own space, but uh, how can collaborate with any different kind of scale organizations. Over this we had different experiences. But uh, just to explain, it's an education platform. Now I call it a solidarity-based education platform. And Chantal Mouffe was calling it <laughs> a, not an art project, but a political project in it initiated by artists. So I don't use the words project and workshop, so I call it solidarity-based uh, education platform. Um, and what happens that we have asylum seekers, refugees, and uh, migrants who have academic qualifications but they cannot, because of legal limitations uh, and language limitations, they cannot practice their uh, own backgrounds. So you can see uh, is uh, mainly our first group of lectures from London and Stockholm and Hamburg. And you can see their backgrounds also here. So everyone comes from, and it's not an alternative art school. Uh, it's, uh, it could be any, any background, any language. So the, our challenge is really huge. Uh, to find ways also, these legal uh, limitations are also hard to, uh, uh, one by one, uh, we, have to dis we have to know what are the sensitivities of each individual involved. So for, for instance, Bridget Longo, we couldn't tell her name, we couldn't show her face, but how can we have her in front of public in the beginning, uh, uh, during our first public events, where they all have to be paid also, like uh, professional academics. And uh, two years later, in a showroom, uh, next uh, hosting institution, uh, we were able to tell her name and she was able to go in front of the public and put her face also uh, with, uh, with her profile on her, on, on her. But in between, many things change. Sometimes we, we make anonymous, sometimes we, because you want to honor the person as well and recognize the academic uh, position of the person. So you want to profile every individual, but uh, often you can't, and that's not on our way, that's not on our problem. We always find uh, the sensitive ways to um, involve everybody who is uh, motivated enough to involve, and not knowing en English or any uh, official language of that country, like uh, Nuri needs to speak uh, Swedish, or Behna needs to speak English, because one in UK, the other in Stockholm, but uh, they do uh, their courses in Arabic and Kurdish. Uh, so we don't need to wait for them to learn the language first. Um, and it's also important, uh, we, we never call anybody students, and, and uh, we don't know what could be the alternative name, but everybody is active members. So we have a lot of people registered online. Now it's, I think, around 900 people. So it's small numbers, uh, almost five years now. Um, from different backgrounds, as you can see, the interest from people uh, is really various, and that's what I wanted, not only like art students or curators interested, but people actually uh, making research and actively involved 
uh, in these issues you know, to be involved. How many minutes I have? So I go a little faster. Can I go a little? A few minutes? Okay, very quickly. These are uh, current existing, uh, two minutes, you show me two minutes. Okay, existing branches and uh, organizations and institutions are changing. Uh, new ones coming and some of them are able to continue since the beginning. Uh, so I'm not going to name them all. And this was our, uh, one of the latest gathering just in June. Um, uh, participants and coordinators from all branches together. So people can be just public first or a guest and even can be organizer, co-organizer, consultant, lecturer later. So everyone sh is shifting position in silent university. I was uh, initiator, now I'm more like a guest. It could be the other way around as well. This is the publication we just did, which is telling a lot about all our uh, failures, difficulties. It's not only like idealizing the, the concept, it's a difficult concept. It's not only like good intention. Uh, good intention is not enough to initiate silent university. You have to be really long-term engaged. So most institutions fail to do that in every scale. They are interested, they do six month research, a year research, and they realize they can't do it. And some others can. This is how it evolved in Stockholm, and so you can see some pictures from different branches, uh, meetings at Silent University in Milham, some of the recent meetings, Hamburg, and, and different activities as well, not only lectures and, and so on. Uh, on my visit uh, in Amman. In Amman, the meaning of refugee that was very interesting, that didn't make any sense. So we just uh, here talk with a given understanding of certain terms, but this is the learning process. Like Amman is one of the most difficult places uh, to initiate this, but uh, a place that you can learn the most. It's one of the lectures there also. We couldn't name at all, we couldn't show his face, and so on. Um, I go really fast, and this Athens. And Athens is different than everywhere else, pretty much, because the main, uh, it's like an assembly model. It's initiated by mostly activists and, uh, and some other people involved as well, even polit politicians involved in the core group. And uh, they bring in different discussions, a feminist aspect of it, or minority within the asylum seekers, and other urgencies, locations, and security also, uh, it came as a big question in Amman. These are the uh, principles and I'm done anyway. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>